So my man, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very excited about this discussion that we are going to have. So first of all, for people who do not know, who is Chris Hunt? Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Um, who is Chris Hunt? I am now a retired bodybuilder. Uh, I'm a husband, God-fearing man. Uh, I've also been a musician almost as long as I've been into fitness, since about five years old. Uh, I used to do martial arts, also from five years old. Um, extremely disciplined, hardworking. Uh, just a normal guy that loves to work out. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. And and just out of curiosity, which martial art? Taekwondo. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, taekwondo. I used to teach. Um, I'm originally from New York, so I, you know, I used to do classes out there and got several black belts. And, yeah. Nice. Are you ITF or WTF? WTF. W <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so I... I I'm already getting off track. So uh, <laughs> I, I did Taekwondo uh, okay. uh, and I ended up stopped. I was WTF. I did that through Tay Lee here in Ottawa. Uh, and I stopped at my black stripe because uh, I was doing it at the same time I was doing residency and um, uh, my medical training. So I was too busy. And I, for many, many years, I've wanted to get back. Uh, and finish at least to get my first degree black belt. Mm. Uh, and then, but I was like our our um uh group that i trained with you had to do um all your hogway humse patterns your um tai guk patterns your one step three step five step sparring uh like all of that and you had so for black belt you had to know them all yeah. and i just thought oh my god man it is i can't i don't have the time to go back and memorize all of those but i just I ran into some people a couple of weeks ago and they said, no, man. So now WTF, you can pretty much do it on Zoom session. Really? You, and, you, and yes, they said, and you only have to do, uh, there's only eight patterns that you have to, to, to do for it. So I was like, oh my goodness, man. I, I, so that has yeah. rejuvenated my, my desire. And even yeah. though I am much older and much less flexible than I was before, I'm thinking, man, I, I might devote some time to going back just to be able to say I attained my my first degree black belt. You know, it's it's it, and you as a martial artist know that ain't nothing, but at least I can say to people I have a black belt, right? Yeah, it's a cool flex. But I, I didn't know it was that that easy now because gosh, it was way harder. Well, yes, but apparently because of COVID, it, okay. it, it they had to change things, and so now okay. people people like that, and so oh, I'm gonna do my patterns and I'm gonna do it on video, and and then they pass you, man. So. Jeez. Okay. And, you know, anyway, so uh, today we're going to be talking about bodybuilding, my friend. So tell me, um, apart from your professional career, what is your, your background in strength training and in bodybuilding? Um, well, from martial arts, it pretty much, uh, I eventually got into powerlifting in high school. And um, I took a really nice liking as far as like my physique and what it was doing, the changes. Um, I got into competitive powerlifting, did really well. And um, I just loved how I felt. I just loved being able to challenge myself and push myself, um, even coaching others and kind of like, at first I didn't really know what as much as what I was doing. I had a lot of like guinea pigs. I was like, hey, let me just help you get in shape. And like over time, I kind of just, as I learned my body, started to learn like others. And I started learning like how to read blood work and kind of analyze you know, like just the physique and just kind of cater like plans to everyone else as well as myself and then find coaches and mentors. And um, yeah, and I just kind of got into bodybuilding and kind of just fell into, once I moved to, to uh, Texas, I kind of met all the right people, all the right circles. Texas was just heavy into bodybuilding. So it was just natural for me to just fall into it. What, what do you think was the catalyst? Like, you know, um, power lifters, bodybuilders, two separate populations, right? Yeah. And there's not necessarily, uh, although there is potentially room for crossover, it, it's not necessarily that, that you know, that much. Um, and there are some athletes that, for example, Larry Wheels, who is, uh, you know, is, uh, started out sort of as a power lifter, and he's now sort of transitioning into bodybuilding, although he kind of does a whole bunch of things. But what what do you think was the catalyst for you that made you say, hey, like, you know, 
not just be, I, I don't just like being strong. I like yeah. the way I look and I want to, you know, master that. I just think not having, I didn't really know the right people until I got out of high school. That's really when it's the change for me. And in high school, the only thing that was strength related was powerlifting. And I love being strong, but after a while, once I actually started to lift weights and I started lifting with like the football players, I noticed that my physique was like developing super quickly. And I was like, okay, I kind of like this. Um, then eventually I went to a show and I, I just kind of, it, it was just crazy how I just met people that were just, I don't know, into the sport. Um, but I always wanted to look good. I always wanted to be competitive. Um, you know, seeing guys like Ronnie Coleman, Dexter Jackson, like all those cats, I, I seen them. And I was like, man, I don't know what they're doing. And I later found out a little bit of what they were doing. <laughs> but I was like, yeah, I don't know what they're doing. But, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy because I remember um, you know, I could barely afford it. But, like, seeing, like, the True Mass bottle from, like, BSN. And I'm seeing Roddy, like, lifting and all the veins popping out. I'm like, if that's what he's taking, I'm going to go ahead and take that. And I'm going to be big like that. And uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was really just mainly just I want to just look good. And I mm -hmm. kind of just fell into it after that. So, so you move to Texas, you meet the right people. So how long, um, you know, were you kind of doing this, uh, you know, in an amateur fashion before you transitioned to a professional? It took me 10 years to turn pro. Uh, I started competing in 2008 as a teenager. I won two nationals um, and first place in collegiate nationals at 18. Uh, won several shows naturally. And um, I kind of crossed over uh, at 21. And then I turned pro in classic um, at the North Americans in 2018. Okay. And so then you competed from 2018 until when, 2022? Or yeah, the 22. Retired this year? Yeah, the 22 Olympia was my last show. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you uh, started out, you met the right people, and you, you, you liked the way you look. So that's your entry into bodybuilding yeah um and then you with amateur professional we're talking 10 years yep. um but then you retired in 2022 you're, you're a pretty young cat and you're, you're much younger than me so you know why is it that you decided to retire from bodybuilding uh it was a combination of things man it's i put my all into everything that i do i'm a i'm a 110 percent kind of guy um and if i if i my why kind of changes and I, I fall out of love with it. If, if I'm kind of waking up like, man, why am I doing this? And there were several shows where just having to make that weight cut for classic, having to lose 10 and 11 pounds in just a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then not having to be able to uh, fill back up, you know, the time given. So I'm bringing a mediocre look when I know I look way better at a much bigger uh, body weight. And then it came to a point where it's like, I was at a crossroads. I was like, well, do I go to 12? Um, I wasn't really comfortable of what I had to do to kind of, you know, get bigger. Um, but I also wasn't comfortable having to suck down and having to do like all these like diuretics and like last minute manipulation. So um, that, and then just, you know, my wife's been through enough. I want to kind of start a family. She's been super supportive. She's been with me before bodybuilding. Uh, we were high school sweethearts. So she's been with me literally the entire journey, every show. Um, so it's like one of those things where it's like when you know, you know, you know, and I, I still make the same amount of money I do now as when I competed. I still have my sponsors. Um, I'm still able to coach. I'm able to kind of be an example that you don't have to leave the sport in a body bag or, you know, injured. You can walk away on, on top. And to my on top was the Olympia. You know, I, I didn't really place that well. It was you can kind of get into that. It was like 65 guys in classic, 65 plus. So it was hard to get a look. But to be able to say that I did the Olympia twice. Um, I don't want to push myself any further as far as going to 212. I'm in a really good physical, mental state. And um, had I continued, I would have probably got to a point of no return health-wise. So mm -hmm. yeah, now I feel great, actually. Good, good, good. Now, before I ask this next question, I, I do have to take a second to say thank you to your wife for allowing you to <laughs> spend time on this Saturday <laughs> afternoon to do this. I, yeah, I yeah. appreciate her giving you up for this time. <laughs> Um, but so you mentioned, you know, uh, potentially moving up to 212. So yeah. here, here is an interesting question. Uh, and then I'll follow it up with uh, another afterwards. But, um, you know, what, what was the weight that you specifically uh, performed at? 
And then what was the weight that you walked around at uh, in between competitions? Uh, in between competitions, it kind of varied. I was most comfortable at around like 205, 210. And um, I had to compete at 180. So it's interesting that um, I, I have uh, spoken in a number of, of long form videos about, um, you know, um, bodybuilding and, and performance enhancing drugs. But in another video, uh, I talked about weight cutting for mixed martial arts and boxing. Mm -hmm. And uh, although they don't do quite the same things uh, because uh, the, um, the drug restrictions are, are quite a bit more um, than they are with bodybuilding, it's, it's insane what athletes have to do to cut weight. And, yeah. and that is a pet peeve of mine um, that people have to do that uh, for, and you know, in this particular case, we're talking about um, bodybuilding, but it's, I still feel the same way about wrestling, boxing, um, mixed martial arts, because um, you could be super healthy, do all of the right things. And just that weight cutting procedure alone, yeah. like people have no clue yeah. what what how detrimental the effects are of doing that yeah, in such physically, a short period of time man mentally oh yeah it's crazy i have i have a almost i remember almost every cut vividly like that's how painful it was but <laughs> my last pro win uh it was right before the olympia um i wasn't even planning to do that show i had did actually i have some of the trophies behind me i had did a show and got like a controversial second and i was like damn i really want to win this one but i got second and i was I was told, hey, just do the show a week later. You're going to easily walk away, win, get your qualification. I'm like, all right, whatever. So um, mentally, I kind of had to prepare to not really balloon up too much, kind of stay somewhat shaped. But there's going to be that kind of water retention for the last couple of days. So I had to kind of mitigate that because I knew I'm going to have to kind of cut back down. Um, so I'm usually show ready in like 190. And uh, I still had to work because I didn't have a... Uh, my PTO was like ran out, almost ran out. So I kind of had to plan like, okay, if I do win this, I'm going to still have to have a couple more days to do the Olympia later. So I had to, I really had to kind of uh, finesse it because I, I, the way my vacation was set up, I had enough time to do that show, win it, and then go to the Olympia. I was, that was like my all, like all or nothing kind of thing. So um, I was working a job where I can work from anywhere. So I had my laptop and I remember like vividly working in the sauna for about six <laughs> hours. Um, having to cut weight right before the show. And uh, the, saw the laptop obviously would get hot, so I would kind of have to go in and out of the sauna. And uh, still doing like Zoom meetings, I was conducting meetings like actually in the sauna, like on my laptop, while still checking the scale and making sure that I uh, cut weight. Ended up cutting weight on the show, but it wasn't really the best look. Mentally, it was just draining. It was, it was just torture. You know, mm -hmm. having to cut. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Self-imposed torture, my man. Oh my god. Yeah, but we love it though. We're kind of all weird. So. There you go. So, um, when it comes to achievements in bodybuilding, you, you know, yeah. you listed a few. Um, but what is your greatest achievement in bodybuilding? And um, as a separate question, because it may be different, what is your proudest moment as a bodybuilder? Hmm. I think my best achievement was turning pro because it took me so long. And uh, I almost remember that, that, uh, that moment, it was just crazy. I, I broke down like almost on the spot, like a baby, like, and I was kind of preparing myself, like, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to whatever, but it literally broke down like right after. Um, so to be able to work for something for 10 years to, to hear like, hey, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to make it. And you almost like start thinking that in your head, like, damn, this is like year five, and I'm still getting you know, top five, top six, like, what is it? Like, what else can I be doing to, to turn prep professional? Um, and to finally do it, that was, that was, that was like a big achievement right there. Uh, proudest moment. Um, it would be tied between winning my first and second pro show and then going to the Olympia both times. Um, definitely in 2020, probably more than 2022, just because of COVID. And I ha ended up having to diet the entire year just because things were shut down. So I was actually getting ready for every show that year. And I would sign the forms. I would book my flight just for it to cancel like two, three weeks prior. Um, just because, you know, with the flights, it was so like uncertain. 
So the first show that opened up was in Omaha, Nebraska. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I signed up. I said, I don't care. I'm whatever date it is. Signed up. And that was my first pro win. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So one of the things that you mentioned um, when you were talking there um, that, and, and we'll get to this a little bit later on, but um, you know, it took you 10 years to get, you know, to, to be able to get pro uh, and to be able to compete. And I think one of the things that um, the young kids, I call them kids, but you know, the young, young adults these days don't really have an appreciation for is the amount of time that it takes for, for you to generate the strength and the size uh, and to do it properly. And, and they think, everybody thinks that you can like shortcut this, like that there's a, a, a magic pill, a magic wand, whatever, that's gonna make it come easy. And, and they don't really understand. And I think back to guys that I grew up with that I went to high school with, who uh, were, you know, have never, never done uh, anything in terms of uh, performance enhancing drugs. They were lifting from that time in high school, and, you know, and now 30 years later, those, those guys are still lifting now and they still look phenomenal. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and maybe they're not, maybe they're not competing, right? But for the general population, 99% of the population, you get those guys, get them to take their clothes off. And they're like, holy shit, like this, yeah. th these guys look phenomenal, right? Yeah. Uh, but that is slow, long, e like just took time to develop. Yeah. Took time think, to develop. I think also um, between that and the fact that it's so much easier to turn pro. Like I turned pro when they were only giving out just a few cards. Um, they give what almost two cards every division, and I mean they're they're, it's, they're giving it away like skittles nowadays. So you definitely don't appreciate it when you have more divisions. No disrespect, like men's physique, but they didn't have that back then. It was literally just male bodybuilding, women bodybuilding. Um, so now you have classic, you have physique, you have these other avenues where you don't have to get as big. It doesn't have to take as much time to go, you know, straight to bodybuilding. So it's a lot easier to turn pro now when they're giving out, you know, almost every placing, top placing. And there's so many divisions to where you don't have to develop legs. You don't have to develop, you know, a massive physique. So I think the appreciation, and this is just general, this is not everybody, but when it's a lot easier, we can kind of walk into a show and, you know, turn pro in two shows and it's hard to kind of appreciate it as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we've mentioned this a little bit leading up to it, but now let's get right into the nitty gritty. Uh, so how prevalent is... Um, PED use or performance enhancing drug use in professional bodybuilding? I think it's very prevalent, man. I, I think there's really, it's a necessary evil. Um, I really don't see any other way as far as if you're going to be somewhat competitive at all on the spectrum, that's male or female. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a necessary evil. It's just one of those things you're going to have to just accept what comes with it and just do it. Just know that it's everywhere. And uh, hopefully with the amount of information that's out there, you can kind of steer yourself in somewhat of a good direction to be somewhat healthy, but um, it's extremely prevalent. It's, it's rampant. Okay. So, you, you know, um, we talked a little bit beforehand and, and we're going to get a little bit personal here. Sure. So um, for you, for yourself in particular, how integral was PED use um, as part of your training regimen? It's different because I actually did shows naturally, one shows naturally. Um, I actually didn't even want to do, I didn't even know what some of these drugs were. Um, it's funny because I was, I want to say either 18 or 19 getting ready for a show. I was like a week or two out. I was super shredded. I was dry, um, but I was natural and I was barely even doing like protein. Like I couldn't even afford it. Like I just had, I was coming out of high school. I didn't make a lot of money. So, um, I was disciplined though. So whatever you told me to do, so I was following my diet. So I was super lean. I was hardworking, but as far as anything else, I really didn't have much knowledge of it. And I was, I was, I remember like vividly, I was in the gym, I was posing in a little posing room. This lady goes, Oh, so how much Lasix are you taking? I'm like, what's that? I have no idea. Like what? <laughs> She's like, well, how are you that dry? Like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just eating and doing a little bit of protein here and there. Um, so yeah, as far as me, man, I, I, it's a little bit different because I, I've done shows naturally. I wanted to wait until I was 21. I don't know why, but just, I guess it was a mental thing, but I waited until I was 21 to actually start. Um, 
and the entire career that I had, it was always health first. Uh, mm -hmm. It sounds like a hypocrite, but it was, if we can, you know, avoid having to do as much to compensate and we, let's just work hard and let's, let's do like a slow continual, let's not balloon up in the off season. Let's stay somewhat lean. Let's do blood work. Let's come off. Um, so it's a little bit different. It was for me. It was like, okay, we have to do this, but let's try to do as as, as safely and kind of monitor as we go. Um, mm -hmm. So, different. so uh, well, you, you're you're retired now. So, so you can you, you don't have to keep the secret sauce secret. Yeah. Um, yeah. But out, out of curiosity, for you, for yours, like if you were to think about the 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 stack that you use, um, number one. Um, how many different uh, substances did you use in total? Uh, and then number two, did this change over time um, or did you pretty much stay on the same stack? It did change somewhat over time. Um, when I first got in, I didn't know too, too much. I was doing my research. I did get a coach. I tried to do it as best I could as far as like getting guidance, but I didn't really know too much about it. So when I was told, hey, do like some trend or do this, so I'm thinking, okay, cool. And I would just do it and, you know, I would balloon up. But uh, eventually, like, I found out, like, how horrible stuff like trend was. And you can literally achieve a really good look without harsh, you know, substances like that. Um, as far as what I took, test was always, like, the basic, like, basis around my stack. Um, I never really went too high because I always had to make a weight class. So with my physique, as soon as I touched stuff, like I would just balloon up. Like just, I was like a, I guess you can call like a hyper responder to where I didn't really need too, too much. So I kept the test always like under 750 a week. And that was whether it was contest or uh, off, off season, whatever. But my sweet spot was around 500. because that was like the, where I can get good gains, but minimal side effects, you know, not too crazy on the side effects. Um, but as far as the injectables, I've done maybe, I've always done like two or three different compounds, maybe Primo. I always loved Primo. Um, not the third, maybe like an EQ or something like that. Uh, so I've always done maybe two or three injectables as far as like the orals. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. It's pretty harsh, bro, on the, on the system, especially like in the off season when you're talking about like Anadrol and D-Ball, but to be honest, I've tried it all. So uh, but over time, I kind of tapered it to where I've done like two or three orals. I'm sorry, not two, two or three injectables, maybe like one oral, like an antivar, a really low dose antivar. Um, kept the AIs in. I'm a, I'm a big fan of like aromas and stuff that are kind of like uh, not be as harsh on like your lipid panel. Um, and then when I came off, of course, I did like the HCG, Clomid, that kind of thing. So, yeah. But it, I mean, it was super basic compared to. <laughs> Yeah. To compare to what yeah. other people are using. Yeah, I mean, that's really it. I would say like maybe five. I mean, between the, yeah, maybe five compounds total. Okay. In a contest. Um, this wasn't one of my questions, but you did mention it a little bit before. Um, and, and I, you know, and hearing what you use, I th I thought about this now. Um, the cost of, of taking these, you know. Um, so number one, roughly how much money um were you spending um and uh you know like the what is the impact that has on your ability to to train and be competitive i would say first of all if you're going to be in bodybuilding you need to have disposable income you need to be able to just spend money and just without it returning for quite some time um and you'll be lucky if you break even now of course you got the especially with social media, there's much just different ways to, to kind of make that money back, but you have to be okay with spending a few grand um, per cycle. I, my average I would spend is I'd say between three and four grand a cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually I got to where I, I got sponsored and you know, I just, uh, it was sent it to me by the box so I didn't have to, to pay for it. But I would have to definitely get two and three jobs sometimes just to make sure that I can just afford being a bodybuilder and being able to, to eat all my meals and um, afford the doctor's visits, afford my cycle, afford like everything that was involved. There's so much more than just the cycle. Um, you have to be okay with just spending that amount of, on food and your health supplements as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, to answer your question, about three, three or four grand. Okay. Um, now, 
so you know you are a professional bodybuilder but let's let's talk for a second about amateur um so how how prevalent you know thinking about well here's two 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 part question hmm. so how prevalent do you think um ped use is in amateur bodybuilding and let's and i want you to answer that question um from when you started okay and then answer it now and then you know if if there is a difference with me um with the exception of taking some compounds out like trend and kind of taking more of a safer approach that was the difference between amateur and pro like by the time i did like my last few pro shows like my stacks were like pretty minimal, bro. And I was just making some crazy, crazy gains. I kind of figured out what my sweet spot was, but I was also in some of the rooms and some of the conversations of, you know, amateurs and pros. And to be honest, there was not much of a difference as far as the stacks. It was just as big, uh, you know, with, with national guys as, as some of the pros that I know, um, sometimes even more. These amateurs, they're, they're pushing themselves to get to that professional status. So you got guys that just, they just don't care. They just want a pro card. They want that IFBB hashtag or whatever it is. And um, they're just going to go, go, go. But then you got guys that are, I don't know, it's just different. It, from personal experience, you know, I've, I've kind of went the other way around where I started hot, higher and kind of figured out what worked for me and kind of tapered down. But yeah, it's it's pretty much the opposite with, with most guys. They start off high and they just go high, high as fuck in there. So. <laughs> I am, um, you know, in one, one of the videos there, uh, I, I included a clip from uh, Dorian Yates when he was on London Real. And, and he talks about like the amount um, that people are using now compared to what uh, athletes uh, and body built, professional bodybuilders were using when uh, he was in his prime. And he just like, he pretty much says he's astounded with how much people are using now compared to back then. And, and not only the, the quantity, like in terms of the volumes or the, the amount of milligrams that they're using, but mm -hmm. also the, the variety of compounds that yes. they're using, um, you know, um, so at various stages, you know, whether they're trying to bulk up, then to lean down, then to um, diurese themselves so that they can be like super shredded, like yeah. it's it just, he said that it was just mind boggling what people are, the combinations that people are using now. Yeah. Right? And the quality is different also. Um, it's not as good. It's a lot more cheap underground stuff. Of course they had cheap underground stuff, you know, back then, but um, you know, you talk about stuff like Parabola and they, they had like the real trend to where you didn't need more than like 70, I think, well, I think it was like 75 milli, I don't know what it was, ampule. I don't know if you remember the ampules back then, but that was actually the real stuff. But uh, so you didn't need to do that much. And guys are, I don't want to say afraid, but they just was told, hey, you just need, this is what you do. This is how much. And guys kind of stuck to that. Whereas now the stuff is, I would say, watered down, especially like when you look at like GH, where you got this Chinese stuff and they're doing three times as much just to get the same effect as like the pharma grade. Um, so yeah, I would say more so the quality. Because of the quality, they're definitely doing a lot. And it shows in their physiques. It shows in some of their training. They're kind of, compensating and they have like that that watery kind of new muscle look you see that a lot more today mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so um one of the things that you talked about was your own personal health um yeah. and you know steps that you took um did you ever have concerns about your own health while you were a professional bodybuilder the entire time uh, whether my health was great or not it was it was you know uh, i've only i've only had two coaches my entire career and with both of them um love them to death still talk to them joseph cortez bobby farley they're really health oriented first so like the first thing they want to see is like blood work how often are you get a blood work like what's it looking like um blood work is not the end all be all it's a good uh snapshot of what's going on now to kind of maybe prevent stuff you know down the road but um we all we always wanted to look at that whether we were on cycle you know off cycle um so i would just say just you know that was like super important to me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so if you uh you know well first of all how how often did you do blood work every three months every three months okay perfect um and if you now look back um, and I, and you know you you said you basically you know came to a point uh, that 
you decided, okay, I'm, I'm done. But if you look back now uh, at your career as a bodybuilder, um, do you think that, uh, and, and, you know, obviously you took steps. Do you think um, if you are looking at it objectively, that bodybuilding as a career has had any effects on your health? Absolutely. Yeah, there's still stuff I'm trying to clean up in my blood work, like right now. Um, mm. And it took me about a year. I've been, quote unquote, natural. I'm just on very, very low TRT for about a year now, a little over a year. Um, and there's still stuff like cholesterol and uh, my creatinine and that kind of stuff. I just I just finished like getting like a full like EKG, stress test. Uh, I, ever, I did all my follow-up nephrologist appointments. So um, I still have to see my gastrologist in a little bit. But um, I'm still trying to like make sure and I'm pretty good. I mean, for the most part, it's I kind of knew going in that there's going to be some stuff that is not going to be as good blood pressure, especially just being black and just, you know, uh, blood sugar levels. So that's kind of stuff I already knew. I had a family history of that even before getting into bodybuilding. So um, I've got doctors that I'm super open with. I'm super cool. I'm like, look, I want to be able to have a good quality of life. This is what I'm doing now. This is kind of like the uh, the steps. And I knew about my retirement. I planned my retirement. That's another thing. I planned it because um, I knew I didn't want to leave, you know, crippled or in a bad shape. So we took those steps. So when, it's, when it was time to kind of come off, if, I, if there's any kind of like medications or any kind of cleanses that I had to do along the way, that always came first before a show. Like it was not, I didn't care about the stage. It was always, okay, am I going to be well enough to continue doing this? Am I going to be well enough to continue after, um, which is way more important to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, right now you're on a, a low dose TRT. Yeah. Um, have you discussed with your physicians the possibility of, um, you know, being able to stop that at some point in time? Or is that something do you think that you'll need to maintain um, basically indefinitely? Well, I tried. I, I stopped for like four months. Um, I want to say... Yeah, the first, maybe I, I did a little TRT maybe a month after the Olympia to kind of just get my levels somewhat stable. And I was like, man, let me just try it. I'm not, I hated being a pin cushion. Let me just, you know, get off and just see what happens. You know, I'll still take natural. I'm still uh, sponsored by a supplement company that has like natural test products. They're nowhere near the same, but I was like, well, maybe they'll keep my levels at, at somewhat, um, which the products work, but it's, it's not going to be nowhere near the same. So I mm -hmm. felt the fatigue. I had pretty much all the side effects to the mood swings, the uh, little bit of acne here and there, just just for my levels not being all the effects you'll have from low testosterone. Um, then I got my blood work and they were like, yeah, your testosterone's like at five. Like you're <laughs> like you need to get on something like today. Like the, uh, it was crazy because I did my blood work. I want to say um, not this last one, but maybe the one before that. And uh, they called me back like, hey, are you OK? Like, how do you you, you know, how are you getting through the day? Like you, you tired? Like you good? And uh, I work so much, like so. To me, I don't really feel a difference. I'm always tired. I'm just grinding. So uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm tired, but you know, I don't make excuses. I, I don't know. But uh, they were like, yeah, you might need to get on some sort of like TRT or something like that. And then I started doing it. And I, I gradually felt, you know, a little bit better, like over time. So I don't mind it if it's if it's gonna, you know, have a, like a good quality of life. Um, I don't mind doing that if I need to. And plus, I know just getting older anyway. I'm gonna have to. Our test is going to decline, so it's going to be something I probably have to do anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, if you um, are just thinking about in general now, um, what would you say uh, is necessary for a bodybuilder to do? Um, well, you know, again, two part question: if, if do you think it is possible for a modern day bodybuilder who is competitive, do you think it's possible for them to mitigate the risks? that are associated with the profession? And if so, what do you think that they need to do? Um, yes, kind of. <laughs> I mean, to mitigate, yes, coming off is big. You know, you have to be able to come off. And off doesn't mean I'm going to bridge at 300 milligrams a week. That's not, I've heard that so many times. Off is off. Like, come off, do what you need to do as far as, like, your uh, PCT, you know, get your levels at somewhat homeostasis and just come off like don't constantly you know have to go from show to show and bridge to bridge i think that's what ruins like a lot of careers um 
but yeah, to mitigate it, do your blood work um, and come off like two of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if somebody does that, you know, follows that advice, what do you think is uh, the typical length of a bodybuilder career in 2024? Hmm. Maybe 10 years. Of course, there's going to be like the anomaly like Dexter Jackson that I don't know how the hell he did it that long. It looked that good. But um, I'm going to say average about 10 years, give or take. And and what do you think is going to be the the, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back, as it were, or the thing that makes them say, OK, I'm done? Um, If it's not a body bag, if it's not a, some kind of injury or, I mean, life altering, you know, a lot of these guys are getting forced out. You know, and that's the problem. Um, They're being told. From a doctor, hey, if you continue this, you're not going to live long. They wait till that point. It's like, damn, why? You know, just that's what sucks when you got so many of these great athletes, guys that I've looked up to just drop. It's like, man, it's like, you know, some, how, do I, how should I put this? Some were told and just, they, they still don't care. Like, I'm just going to do this. But um, others just don't even check. They don't even know what's going on. Like, just, just keep going and going and going. And then something happens, you know, unfortunately. And, you know, they have a, a short life, you know, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. so. You know, it's interesting. Um, so one of the videos that I did was about Ronnie Coleman. And in that video, I wasn't really talking about steroids, man. I was talking about his back and mm -hmm. just, you know, um, that is part of a series that I called the price of bodybuilding. Cause I just wanted to talk about what, what people, the extent that they go through. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear the, the, uh, to read the comments on that. And there's comments on both sides, but a lot of people are like, yo man, Ronnie, that, that, that guy's the goat. And he was just like, uh, there, it was all worth it. And I, I think to myself, you know, Ronnie, uh, I have never heard a piece of content or seen anything where he said he regrets what he's done. Right? right. And he has the one famous quote where he says, you know, when he, when he benched 800 plus for, for two reps and right. they said, what's your biggest regret that I didn't do one more. Right. And I go, sure. But you know, when Ronnie is alone by himself in a private room, I'm sure I could be wrong, but I am sure Ronnie is not happy with his decision to push himself to the extent where he's had to have 12 back surgeries, man. I'm, I'm, I'm sure like when, what quality of life is that? You know what I mean? When you see him struggling with these crutches and you think to, when you look back to the size, the mountain of a man that he was yeah. and the strength that he had and to be reduced to that, I'm sure that does not sit well with him. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I mean, to be, it's tough. To, it's easy to say that, but then you never know. I mean, you got, I've only witnessed a fraction, not even a fraction of how that feels. And in that moment, and there's been some times, but to be able to pick up that, I think the most I've dealt with was maybe like a little over 600 pounds. And it felt amazing. Like to be able to just steal that. And, and you got to be a little crazy to do this. You got to be like under that squat rack and be like, man, I may not get back up. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> if I got to crawl out this gym, you know, there's a part of us that is, you know, so yeah, there's probably some moments where he does feel kind of sucks. He can't play with his, I don't know, he's got like 20 kids, but uh, I don't know. The other part is like, yeah, he probably means what he says when he's, he regrets doing three. If I'm going to be in a, in a wheelchair the rest of my life, you best believe I want to do three, four, <laughs> you know? So it's, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. It, it, man, it's, it's, I, I feel for him, you know, and, I, yeah. and not, not that he necessarily wants anybody to feel feel uh, sorry for him. But, you know, as a medical professional, when I, I it, it really hurts me inside when I yeah. when I see him moving around, you know, but I see him. I see him all the time. He's out here in Texas. He's only like maybe 30 minutes from me. So, I mean, he's still in the gym. He still has a smile. I don't think I've ever seen that guy like sad. Like and this is with no cameras. This is literally just him. He's still saying, yeah, buddy, lightweight like it's. Even some of the weight he's pushing is still impressive, like even now in, in the, his, the state that he's in. So he's, I think he's just really like that. It's not an act. I think he's just genuinely just happy to be, you know, I don't know. I can't, I don't agree with it personally, but um, it's definitely not an act. He's, he's the same off, you know, he's just as happy. So. All right. So um, if you were to think about uh, bodybuilders today, 
Okay, so let's just put aside the PED use for a second. Okay, I'm just talking about uh, overall appearance and and you know what they look like. If you were to compare bodybuilders to the, of today to bodybuilders of you know years gone by, so whether you're talking about Ronnie Coleman, whether you're talking about um, you know, Dorian Yates, Arnold Schwarzenegger, even older, you know, mm. compare, compare now to then. What do you think are the differences? Um, I, I would say with their training, there's a certain look to the physique that is just undeniable that you can just tell he picks up. It doesn't, you don't even have to know what he's doing in his kitchen or whatever, but you know, that he's picking up some heavy weight. And it was that that rugged, dense look that those guys had back then. Um, it could be a combination of stuff, but I know for sure the training is a little bit different, and that does show up in your physique. You can tell when a guy is is uh, kind of going the more supplement route and kind of lax in his training, or he's trying to find like reinvent the wheel and maybe not train as heavy. Or there's so many different like techniques and like fads and like quick routes or whatever to try to train and. They just try to reinvent the wheel. You just need moderate volume, heavy weight. And you can just tell that those guys are just putting in that work. That's serious, like iron time. And it's showing their physique with that dense, mature muscle. That mm -hmm. This guy is doing it today. Uh, definitely this guy is doing it today. But I said overall, it was definitely more back then as far as the training. So, um, you know, if, if you think about the, the work curve, okay, um, and if you basically think about the volume underneath that curve, right, you can get to that. You, there's different ways you can get to that volume, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do less reps, heavier weight, or you can do lighter weights and a shit ton of reps, right? Mm -hmm. German volume training. So do you, so you think that, and, and hold on for a second. So you, there's those two routes, but yet you can still, like if you add it all up, the volume of weight is the same. But do you think um, that when you go those two different routes, you're going to look different? Yes, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. It is. Even though they're lifting the same um, same yeah. volume of weight. Yeah. Nah, this is a completely different look to the physique. You can just tell. Like when you look at Dorian, like the way he trained, like it was very few guys that achieved that level of muscularity and he just needed crazy crazy now the low low volume he took it a little bit too extreme as far as like how much volume but as far as like the heavy weight you gotta there's no substitution for lifting heavy you have to mm -hmm. um so what are your thoughts on the mass monster look that that seems to be prevalent you know uh mm -hmm. these days uh i mean it, it's uh, it's been around for a while it's been a lot more prevalent, I would say, when Jay and, and Ronnie were kind of battling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely prevalent now, but I, I would say it's weird because I would say it's more towards what the judges are favoring in the moment. And because they're rewarding that or they were rewarding that, guys are kind of pushing to that look. So it's like when you're being told, you know, to be more fuller, fuller really means you just need to be bigger. That's really what it, it, so whenever you hear the term fuller, chances are, you got some chance, you just some guys that were flat, but if you need to be fuller, that usually is code for, you know, get some size on you. So mm -hmm. if they're rewarding that, you know, the guys are kind of achieving that look and kind of pushing and pushing and pushing. I would say more now, especially with Derek and Hottie and these other cats, they're kind of rewarding and Samson. Um, these guys are big, but they have more like tapered physiques, more shape, uh, a good balance of condition. So it's, it depends on what the judges are kind of looking at as far as like the standard and what they're rewarding and guys are kind of just chasing that in the moment. Do you, so do you think that, you know, um, a desire to be fuller um, has influenced um, or changed in any way um, the extent of PED use in bodybuilding? Absolutely. Yeah, because... When you got to get bigger, you got to just do more, just more of everything, not just supplements, just it's more food. It's just, it's just more. Um, mm -hmm. So if that's where the, the direction, hopefully not, because, you know, like I said, with the last couple of years, it doesn't really seem like that's going, but you still got your, your Nick Walkers and you guys that are just freaks. Um, but yeah, if, if you're being told, if that's what's being, I mean, I've been told several times, 
because you know as far as that fuller look and that's another reason why I stopped competing because it's like look I can't put any more muscle on a, a 180 pound frame and I don't want to push to get to 230 just like have to come back down to be somewhat competitive in 212 and have to take another two three years of, of growing and probably shortening my life and just to be fuller you know so <laughs> <laughs> just to be so, fun uh, yeah man it's just yeah you, yeah more is more when, when they when they tell you to be fuller that means just be bigger so what do you think came first the 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 horse or the cart or in other words um do you think that the current state of bodybuilding is a function of the judging or has the judging changed to reflect current trends in bodybuilding I think the judging has, I think it was the latter of what you said, um, especially with like social media being more, you know, popular. Uh, and these judges, they're on your social media, believe it or not, they're seeing, they're kind of seeing what the trends are, what's, what, what people are liking, what's getting like the popularity and, you know, it just it is what it is, you know, as mm -hmm. far as, yeah, it sucks. But, you know, when you say like politics, but, you know, as far as like that direction, I would say, yeah, especially with social media and judging, yeah. Which is a perfect segue into my next question then. So um, how much do you think, like if, if you're trying to quantify this now, how much do you think that social media has influenced current trends in amateur and professional bodybuilding? You know, like, is it 25%, 50%, or do you think it's like 99.5%? Tough to say because, it's tough to say because uh, there are some, I'm not going to name names, but there are some judges that just want to see the best physique. Um, on there, but it's politics as far as who's being hyped on this platform, who's sponsored with this company, is, is the company sponsoring the show, there's, there's a lot of that, the kind of uh, who might have paid the judges, and um, I've got receipts for all this, so I'm not making this up, so I, this is like real stuff that goes on, um, but that has an influence, but that's not everyone, look, there's no, there are some, you know, judges, there are some people in the sport that's just like, look, I don't care what who what kind of following you have. Like, are you did you come in shape today? Are you are you better than you know your last showing? Did you improve? Did you listen to what we said? Um, so I said it would be a mixture. So I, I guess fifty percent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you know now that we're talking about social media, um, we we mentioned him a little bit. Um, but what are your your general thoughts about um, Sam Sulik? Um, so and we'll talk about him uh, and then other. Uh, social media bodybuilders. Sam, um, before I say any of this, I'm not a hater. <laughs> I barely know the guy. It's just I, I kept seeing his name and his face. Um, I think it was, he was all even on uh, Joe Rogan. I mean, this guy is like super, super popular. And I saw his social media. He's got like millions and millions. I'm like, who is this guy? And then um, I love Hostel. I love uh, Fuad. So, you know, when I saw that they, they picked him up, I'm like, man, this guy must be you know, the real deal, whoever this guy is. So I listen, like reading and, you know, listening and seeing the social media and the videos here and there. Um, and I'm like, man, this guy's really young. And the, the amount of like muscle he's got on, clearly he's on quite a bit of stuff. I mean, you see his, his physique, uh, his skin, uh, it just doesn't look good at all. And then I'm hearing some of the stuff as far as like his diet and what he does. I'm like, man, this is not, you know, I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. I'm obviously going to probably sound like a hypocrite saying this because obviously I've done stupid stuff too. But I would say, especially with social media and having that big of a platform, I just think there's a lot of cats that are his age. What is he like? He's not even 20, 21. I don't know how old he is, but he's super young. Um, I think it's a disaster, to be honest, when you're not fully open. And I understand why you can't be, especially with that kind of... Uh, you know, he's probably in his contract. He's, he's got to have a certain image, you know, as with most bodybuilders. So I get it. It's just that with the internet and these little kids, they see that and then they know that he's going to have to do this, this, and this to get big. And when you're not really super open about it or, or promote health, even just from eating, like some of the stuff that he's eating is like some of the worst shit I've ever seen. I'm just like, man, genetics or not. Like I, I keep hearing about genetics. It's like, nah. <laughs> it's not just about genetics like yeah of course you can get away with stuff like yeah i can eat ice cream and still look you know decent too but does that mean that it's healthy does it mean that it's is good as far as like promoting the sport like eating ramen like 
you know, what benefit, like I get you're, like, you're the college kid trying to promote, you know, you know, being on that kind of budget and eating, but I don't know, there's, there's better information out there. Just either get another job, get, find some way to, to afford, you know, doing like doing it properly. Um, not so much just macro based. I can just eat this, and fit, fit this in, you know, whatever, and kind of eat junk and look halfway decent. But I don't think that's the best way to promote it when you have such a big platform. Um, you got cat guys that are saying like, all right, well, I can eat a burger too. I can eat this and this and eat ramen and look look like that and and take God knows what. Um, so I don't know. I just think he can be doing a little bit better as far as like promoting the sport better. But this is it's not a personal dig because from what I've seen, he's actually probably a really nice guy. So it's not a, not a personal attack. But um, just from a bodybuilding perspective, is I think it's a train wreck, a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I'm, I hope I'm wrong. I hope he he's around for a while, you know, in the sport, but just, just looking from the outside and knowing just a fraction of what it takes, especially at that age and he, and the platform he has, I think it's, it's really bad, honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a few things, you know, so, for, so number one, um, having a YouTube channel or having several YouTube channels that I'm involved with um, and looking at just the numbers that he's dealing with, man, he, he is not a poor college student anymore that he can, he can afford to. Yeah, it's definitely like, the whole Kai Green thing of like promoting, like, you know, coming from the bottom and it works. I mean, obviously it, like there's so many guys that fit in that category of like the guys who are uh, on the come up, the, the young guys. So I get it as far as why he got that popular. And like I said, if he has some, any kind of personality, which I haven't seen too, too much, but I'm sure he's a nice guy. I'm sure he's, you know, great communicator. So he's like the next Chris Bumstead as far as like popularity. So I get it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you need to put a, I don't want to say facade, but just promote that as long as ramen spit your macros that you're okay. And as long as the, all calories are created equal, like that is the biggest, you know, I'm trying to not to curse, but... <laughs> That is like the worst thing you could promote. And then just and just look at him. He just looks extremely unhealthy. I'm like, I'm looking at this guy's. I saw a couple of videos. I'm like, damn, this guy looks like you're like, bro, you all right? Like you look mm -hmm. like you're going through it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, it's funny because like um he uh uh he he he's when I think about the comments on on the video that I posted. Um, like you said, I, this is not a personal attack. I, he sounds like a decent guy. Like he, you know, I, I, I don't know what he's like as a person, so I can't really comment other than what I see and say, yeah, he seems like a down, uh, uh, um, an okay guy, but there are some things that I can, uh, that I can observe from what, he, what he does or what he says he does. And so, you know, you, we talked already about, um, things that you can do to mitigate risks while you're doing this, right? And I can tell you, if you're gonna take the time to do your blood work, to um, you know, uh, have a physician monitor what you're taking and all this kind of stuff, if you are going to be that careful on that side, you are likewise going to be as careful with what you eat, how you yeah. consume it and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. so um, I, People pointed out in the comments uh, that I don't know what he's taking. I don't know what his stack is. I don't know how, how how healthy he's being or whatever. And they are absolutely correct. But when I observe, you know, what he's talking about, what he's consuming for his diet, right. and I think, well, that is not necessarily the same as steroids, but if that behavior is a proxy for your behavior over there. And I think to myself, that tells me, yeah, you you really don't care that much, right? Yeah. I mean, and, it shows in his physique. Like, you don't see what nineteen year old guy looks like that it, it, with that kind of development. And it's not. I'm not trying to sound like a hater. It's, it's just obvious. It's super, super obvious. Um, and I don't know what he's doing either. And I hope he's doing. And, and that's another thing. So, like, even if you know, because it's so obvious, you should maybe do a video. And again, maybe the videos out there, I, I haven't really seen too much. Of going to the doctor, of showing your there's other bodybuilders that I know, like Guy Cicinino, uh, uh, maybe Nick Walker, guys that actually show like these doctors' visits, the chiropractor visits, the uh, getting the blood work done. Some some even go over the blood work and just say, hey, stuff is good. It could be a bunch of bull, but at least they're showing that, hey, guys, yes, this is you know I don't have to go into the, every detail of what I'm doing, but obviously this is a part of it. But I'm taking some sort of uh, precautionary, at least show it on video. So like the kids can 
the kids that are his age, like, oh, okay, so maybe I do have to get checked up if I'm gonna. You're gonna do it anyway. You're gonna do the the, the cycle. You're gonna look up to these guys. So it, there's no point in saying, hey, don't do steroids. You're gonna obviously look at the video. You like the lifestyle. Something led you to click this video. So you're gonna you're interested in one way or the other. So if you're going to do that, at least do this other thing as well. At least try to eat somewhat clean. At least at least try to take these you know warm when you train. Get your blood work done. You know, show the doctors, visit the chiropractor, the stuff that actually gets involved. The, your health supplements, not the sponsored using your coworker, not that shit, but the actual like your CoQ10, like the stuff that you're uh, that you're actually taking, like your for your cholesterol, if you are your kidneys, your or for all your major. Show what actually is being done. You know, without showing, you know, so much of the dark side, but but make it known that hey, it's it's a part of the sport as well. And because of that, I'm doing this and this and this to try to stay healthy. If he did that, then all right, cool. I wish you the best and hope he has a long, long, you know, career. And and if he is, again, maybe I don't know. I don't, I didn't see too too much of his videos, but from what I've seen, I, I don't think that's that video is out there right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and likewise, I, I I hope that he remains healthy. He has a long career, but I I have seen. Um, you know, in, in creating content around this topic, I have seen way too many young, young, young athletes who are not here any longer, you know, yeah. um, for, for various reasons. Right. And it all probably centers around that. Um, and, you know, when I think back, you know, you mentioned just about how he looks at such a young age. One, like when I was in university, I played uh, football. So I played, so I'm Canadian. So I, I played at a Canadian university. And at that time, the university that I played at uh, was basically like um, one equivalent to an American Ivy League uh, team. So, um, you know, the university that I played for, we, we won the Vanier Cup, which is, you know, um, our, our highest level um, of football uh, in the country. And, um, being on a team that competitive, I was around dudes. I didn't take steroids, but I was around dudes that took steroids, right? Um, I knew guys in high school that took steroids. But I can tell you, and 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 even up until the point where I, I was drafted into the CFL, which is, you know, compared to a Canadian equivalent to the NFL, even up until that point, I did not see anybody that was a similar age that looked like that. And yep. I knew some dudes that were um, doing steroids and lifting some heavy weight. Yep. Yep. I, and they still didn't look like that. Yep. So, you know, uh, granted, I'm not in the gym where everybody's, I'm not in the gym now where everybody's taking steroids and, yep. and I'm not up to speed on what, what is the, what the current stacks are and all of that. But I can tell from my own experience, I never saw anybody that looked like that at that yep. age. And I was around people. You know, and it's so, not even just the muscle. The muscular development is is one thing, but he just genuinely looks unhealthy in his face. Like mm -hmm. that's really what I'm. <laughs> yes, he's big, but he just looks. I don't know if you took a really good look at it. And again, I'm not. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't sound bitter or whatever like that. But he just, just his face, his co complexion, the something just looks off. Like he just has that almost like abuse, like early abuse uh look like the physique that you can kind of tell like if you're abusing um and your skin texture uh the amount of acne and just the way that the muscles form you can just tell it, it's the quick route it's, and it's just too much too too much too fast mm -hmm. um so one of the things that uh has been quite commonplace uh of late um and and I think this really kind of ballooned a little bit during COVID um is the ready availability of of PEDs, SARMs uh, online. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that uh, that availability has changed bodybuilding today? And if so, do you think has changed for the better or for the worse? It's changed um, for both, actually. Um, it's different because, you know, the, the people who are going to access this, there's really not much you can do to tell them no so gonna we gotta already kind of get that out of the brain they're going to do it anyway whether it's from the guy that's at the gym or, or online so um so we we gotta we you know we gotta kind of get that out of our mind but as far as like the access there are good sites there are good brands um out there and they're also not so good um but with the internet you can kind of research 
ask around, look at these like forums or or whatever, and and kind of find out, you know, like the best route and how to get it. But that comes with a risk of you may be in an area where you just, I don't know, you're not. We're not in, all in Canada that we can kind of just do that kind of stuff. You know, some of us in the state, you know, you're taking a risk if you're gonna get. Uh, personally, I've used online gear for many years. You know, um, I I did both. I I used to kind of it's kind of we kind of started like the guy in the gym and hey like, you know guy that kind of trusted and uh, you kind of kind of build a trust uh, and eventually I kind of went there the online route and even up until my last show I um, the the gear sponsor I had a gear sponsor I still have a gear sponsor um, they same like my TRT stuff but uh, it's a trusted brand and when I tell guys um, I don't like to be a hypocrite it's like man I know you're gonna do this stuff anyway I, I'd hate for you not to but you know, I'm not going to try to convince you um, otherwise. But if you are going to do it, go here, here, here. Here's a, here's a good site. Here's at least a reputable site that I personally use. Um, so I think it's good and bad with that. So um, do you think, uh, and, and you mentioned this a little bit, but there are, there are a number of different classes uh, of bodybuilding that, um, you know, people can compete in today. Uh, and if you consider all of the classes, do you think that there is any possibility that an athlete today can be competitive at a professional level in bodybuilding without PEDs? Hmm. How competitive we're we talking? Are we talking like just top ten? Are we talking like the very best of the Olympia? Because there's just different tiers of being competitive. You can be competitive. Sure. Well, well, let so let's say top ten. And then is there a possibility that you could win any class? As far as the Olympia, hell no. There's just no, just no. Um, no. Even the last place, Olympia is juice to the gills. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as far as the pro show, I mean, maybe you got you got your handful of guys that are just like your anomalies that are just freaks that are just, they were born like that. They, they don't really have to do much and they just look like that. And they, they may place pretty well, like a low, you know, find the right show to do and, you know, get the good look and you'd happen to be conditioned to be the best guy that day, but that's so few and far between. Uh, so I'll say for the most part, hell no. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> apart from yourself, okay. And, and I'm not trying, not saying that I I'm trying asking you to spill dirt on anybody. Okay. But apart from yourself, we talked about the, the safety things, uh, and the steps that you did to mitigate risks, okay? If you were to think of other bodybuilders that you know of in the industry, so um, who would you recommend? You know, if I'm an up-and-coming young bodybuilder and I want to look to somebody um, who you think is doing things the right way and looking after themselves as they need to be, Give me, can you give me like three names? So you, you know, you've talked about what you did, but do you think, can you think of three people that you would respect and you would say to a young up and comer, yo man, look, look at this, look at this cat over here, you know, mm -hmm. check him out, see what he's doing. Do likewise. That's like a top pro. Like top that. pro. Dexter, for sure. Uh, hmm. Maybe Lerone, maybe just because he was known for, I don't know how extreme he would, because he would do those crazy transformations from being just a, a normal looking guy three months out from a show and, and then win the Arnold class or, you know, be like top two at the, at the Arnold. Uh, but he was big on like coming off and just being normal. So kind of. Uh, third guy. Hmm. That's a tough one. <laughs> I don't really know, like personally, what I kind of go from, like the, you know, like the videos. Maybe Jay, maybe I think Jay's been he's been extreme, but he's been uh, somewhat smart as far as like his overall per approach, as far as like training and. But it was extreme, so I don't I don't really know. I mean, I would just say just as far as like a actually no scratch that Lee Haney, mm. just uh, Lee Haney probably had like the best career of a bodybuilder of all time. Still jacked uh, this day, man. Yeah, I mean he's the family man. He's family man. He got out super young. He's won all these all the Olympias. Uh, I would say Lee Haney for sure. Okay. That'll be my third. Um, 
and this just came into my head now. Um, but, and again, I, I'm not, I don't know whether you personally know him or, or what, but, uh, what are your thoughts? I've just, it just, as you're mentioning names, I, it just popped into my head and, and he's Canadian dude too. So, uh, Chris Bumstead, what are your thoughts on Chris? Um, super popular. He, he was like the perfect guy he came at the perfect time. He's got the perfect look, says the right things. Uh, great personality, great for the sport. I mean, he literally put the whole classic division on his back. Um, uh, great businessman. Um, as far as the health, I mean, I've, I think everyone kind of already knows his story as far as, you know, the, some of the health stuff he's kind of gone through. And, you know, there's kind of controversy behind that. It's like, do you continue? Like, what else do you have to prove? Do, you know, um, I thought he was going to actually retire last year. I'm surprised he's still doing this. Um, he's a millionaire. I don't really know why he's still there. He's, I guess he just loves it. Or, um, But there's not really much bad to say. I mean, I think he's great for the sport. The positive guy. He does a lot of social media. Great businessman. Um, his physique is nuts. Like if you see this guy like backstage, it's it's crazy to see this guy's physique is um, out of this world. Like it's just crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't really have nothing bad to say about him except you know I hope he kind of watches, and I'm sure he is. He's got plenty of people on his team, but uh, you know that'll be the only thing I would kind of say is kind of watch out. He he really doesn't need to compete anymore, to be honest. I'll be I'll be shocked if he still goes uh, and does another Olympia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Doesn't have to, doesn't need to. He can win 10 if he wants to. <laughs> Maybe that's the number, man. Yeah, I, I don't think he's going to, I think he's going to stop it. What, what he's got, like four or five now? Yeah, five, I think five. I think five, yeah. What, who else is going to get, you know, five or, or even close to five? I know Ramon's probably going to get a couple. Urge got these guys that are coming up, but I mean, he's had the whole division on his back. There's nothing else. He can walk away tomorrow and be just as popular or probably even more, get into acting or something different. I mean, he's, he's the single most popular fitness influencer probably of all time. Next mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were, um, uh, you know, counseling a young, like you, so you're coaching now, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you were counseling an athlete today who said to you today, Hey, Chris, man, I want to get into bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Um, what, how are you going to counsel them? Tell, tell me, what, what are the, you know, three or four most important things that you're going to tell them about what they need to do and, and what to expect? It depends on their goal. Like, it, it depends on exactly, if, if it's an athlete that is adamant on competing at the Olympia, going all the way, uh, I would say keep your circle extremely small. Like, make sure that you have a coach doesn't have to be me it could be me cool but don't listen to you know all these people that are in your ear the guys at the gym these other coaches like, hey you should probably be doing this like listen to one person if you're going to have a coach follow have somebody that you trust in your corner that you can actually follow like their direction and also uh do your own research like figure out like okay here's what i'm comfortable doing um even with me and my coach it was it was more so he would tell me what to do I would kind of tell him what my overall goal was. I was very clear as far as like uh, the route I wanted to go as far as my health, my end goal, like everything was pretty much planned out almost from the beginning um, as far as where I wanted to go with the sport. So be very, very clear and have as few people or, you know, stick to one person if you can, um, as far as like guiding you and don't be afraid of coming off. You're going to look different. You may look, you know, maybe not as uh, full or, uh, the weight may feel a little bit different. You may feel a little lethargic, but understanding that's necessary to, to take that one or two step back before you can leap, you know, forward into your next uh, cycle or prep or whatever you want to do um, as far as the sport. And third would be get a job. Make sure you have enough money. <laughs> Don't be out here trying to scrap. Don't, you cannot be, do not scrap for food. Like you cannot, don't put no GoFundMe's. I hate that shit where these people put these GoFundMe's for these shows. Like this is a luxury sport. Like understand that you need to have a lot of disposable income. So whatever that means to you, as far as being able to afford uh, everything is, you know, whether it is coaching or everything, just make sure that you have a, enough income to support that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, looking back, do you think it was more you um, pushing the health angle with your coach your coach, um, you know, pushing that with you or, you know, were you both right on the same page, right from the get go? 
we're both on the same page. And that's why I was with him for so long. I think my first coach, I was with him uh, 10 years, I want to say. And we were always on the same page. Even my second coach, Bobby Farley, who's, who's an amazing coach out in Atlanta. Uh, it was different because there was a brief moment in between those coaches where I won't say his name because he's a still, he's, he's a pretty big coach now. And I was only with him for maybe like a month or two. And um, I remember he was big on the macro stuff, which I hated. Uh, his, and he, he pushed way too much as far as like the food, the subs, everything was bad. The training, it was literally, there was nothing good. I got super big, but I was uncomfortable and it was not the direction that I wanted to go. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I, this is not for me at all. So I was fortunate enough that that lasted for a very short amount of time. And I actually had two really good coaches that from jump, I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. This is this is what it's going to be. You're either on board or not. And they were 100 percent on board. And we've had a great relation open, you know, for discussion, feedback. Feedback is a two way street. That's another thing with these athletes. You have to be able to give feedback as much feedback, as much information as possible um, for the protocols or whatever you're doing. So that way your coach has enough to pull from to, to know like what the best route is as far as where to take your physique. So it was good that I felt comfortable and be able to like ask questions and say, hey, it doesn't really feel right. Or I'm noticing that, you know, when I'm eating this meal, here's my digestion and recovery. And that's some of the stuff that I'm doing either with, with my uh, athletes. I have my first pro that I, I groomed. I don't want to say groomed, but I took him from being an amateur. and He just turned professional uh, last year. So it's cool that, um, you know, over the years, I've been with him for two years now. He's been my athlete, and uh, he's really big on feedback. It was, it's, again, a two-way street. He's like, man, I don't really feel comfortable doing this. I'm like, All right, cool. And there's, there's multiple ways to skin a cat. So you have to be able to be open with your coach and give feedback and also take feedback and understand that, you know, at times that this is the coach, this is what it's going to be, and, but also be willing to be like, hey, I don't really feel comfortable doing this. Have that mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, I have this saying that I, I, I tell my, I have three young adults, well, I shouldn't say they're young adults, they're adults now, I have three children, adults. Um, I say them, I say this to them often, and I remind myself of this often. Um, and I think this is true in life, I th think it's true in business, I think it's true in anything that you do. And, and it sounds the same, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, professional bodybuilding and your coaches. Um, and, and the saying is that, we are the sum of the five people that are closest to us, right? And I always tell my kids, uh, and I think this myself, pick your five people very, very carefully, right? Because that, that's going to influence where you end up. And if you think about where you want to be, you, you just need to look to who do you have around you? Um, yeah. Because that will determine what, who, you know, what you're going to be, who you're going to be, when you're going to be it. Yeah, I agree. A thousand percent. Um, yeah, it applies to life. Just, <laughs> that's literally, um, I know this is kind of off topic, but I'm a musician. I've been a musician my entire life. And it's the same thing. I wanted to develop skills. So I had to kind of surround myself and always be like, uh, I always wanted to be the person with the least amount of knowledge when I walked in the room. I wanted to be around people that are who kind of where I want to go, who who kind of walk that path. And um, those are the people that are, that are successful that I, I kind of want to emulate and kind of, uh, inspired to be so mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. are the kind of people so I, I love what you just said there um and I, I also think the same thing too like I, I never want to be the smartest guy in the room right yeah. I, I, I want other people who are smarter than me that I can yeah. that I can sponge off of I can learn shit from yeah. that's what I want to be right yeah. um and and that's how I know I'm in the right place when there are smart other people who are smarter than me around yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, They're, yeah. Anyway, so Chris, this has been a fantastic conversation. Again, thank you very much for 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 agreeing to do this. And and don't forget to thank your wife for giving you up for <laughs> for an hour and a half on this Saturday afternoon. Um, last question for you. Uh, where can people find you online, my man? Online. So my email is Chris Hunt. Hunt does have an E at the end, so it's Chris H U N T E 1233 at Gmail. Uh, my Instagram is Chris Hunt underscore IFBB Pro. Facebook is Chris Hunt, and I got a YouTube page. Just type my name in. It's, I'm kind of new to the YouTube world, so I'm kind of dropping videos here and there, podcasts and uh, gym stuff. So you can just hit me up. And I'm here. All right. Well, thank you very much.